Welcome to this very special episode of Amusing Jews, where we celebrate Jewish contributors and contributions to American popular culture. With the Writers Guild of America Strike still pushing on, we thought it would be informative to have screenwriter Michael Elias back on to share some of his experiences with previous writers' strikes. I'm Jonathan Friedman. And I'm Joey Angelfield. Producer-engineer Mike Tomrin is working somewhere behind the scenes. Amusing Jews is a project of Adat Chaberim, Congregation for Humanistic Judaism, the Cool Shul Jewish Cultural Community, and Atheist United Studios. Our special guest today is Michael Elias, an award-winning writer, actor, and director who has written film, television, theater, and fiction. Michael was the co-screenwriter of The Frisco Kid and The Jerk, created the hit sitcom Head of the Class, and more recently has turned to writing novels, including You Can Go Home Now. Michael, welcome back to Amusing Jews. Thanks. I'll try to live up to the introduction. When we asked you to come back on the show to talk about the writer's strike, you had mentioned that you're no longer active in that world and that you might not have much to say, but we're interested in the history of writer's strikes. This isn't the first one, and it will probably not be the last. I'm sure you have some stories to tell. We all have uh, a trunk, which has screenplays that didn't sell, and we'd like to sell them. So we fix them up and maybe change the title and try to sell them. So I have a couple of those. And I have um, uh, some novels I've adapted into screenplays. So I've got stuff. What I'm not in is uh, the daily... Uh, grind or joy of writing on a television show, and I never will. I'm still trying to sell and attach maybe some TV projects. But then, like my novel was adapted, or my novel was optioned by Sony um, to uh, become a try to become a series, a streaming series, uh, but uh, they weren't successful. I suspect it was the politics of the uh, attacking the anti-abortion. Uh, terrorism. Um, anyway, we, we don't know, but we'll try for a movie. But I have a daughter-in-law who's, who is a showrunner and has worked for Apple and uh, was about to sell the show to Netflix when the strike happened. So there are a lot of... Uh, so I'm still connected, and I pick it. Um, I pick it Fox. It's my favorite uh, picket place that has... It, I, I like Fox because... It's close, uh, has good parking, uh, and uh, I like the food <laughs> because sometimes some of the uh, it's it seems to be the fashion now that uh, uh, writers who really did well, Simpson guys, uh, every once in a while they uh, they send over a taco truck, so uh, people try to get there you know around lunchtime, <laughs> pick it. I don't think I suffered during that period because one of the things is I think we had really good residuals today. We don't have many more. Um, the streamers don't I think they pay residuals. You get you get bought out. But uh, and you all only do even if you do, you only do eight eight to ten episodes. Um, when I started uh, a show had twenty six to twenty nine episodes. So you wrote as many as you could. The career of a television writer then was, it was called, uh, we were all freelancers, mostly freelancers. So you could write three Dick Van Dykes. You could write two, My Mother, The Car. You could write a couple of... Uh, I don't know, if you were if you were a sitcom writer, you know you could do, and say say you you are in, you you wrote ten shows, three here, two there, one here, you could make. Yeah, I think you made fifteen thousand. I don't know, but you could make it you know, like a hundred grand, which was huge then, and then. The residuals would give you another half of that for the first year, so you could do okay. Um, it gradually became more difficult to be, say, a sitcom writer. Um, and that would be, the, by the way, the same for variety shows. If you were writing Laugh In or uh, uh, whatever, uh, Glenn Campbell, you know, those shows, again, it was 26 episodes. 
And in those days, and I say 70s, 80s, you didn't have writer's rooms. You had writer, it wasn't even the concept really of writer-producer. It was more producers. And then you would, yeah, you would have writer-producers, but they would be usually the creators of the show and maybe a couple of writers on staff. That was it. Um, some people say that by making writers producers, you created a division between writer producers who and and writing staffs. As I said, as a freelancer, you would just go and you would pitch a, you would pitch a uh, a sitcom idea to all in the family, but you, there were only two guys working on it, maybe three. All the family had three people. That was it. Uh, they wrote a couple, and then everything else was uh, freelance writers. So gradually, they started adding writers to rooms, and all of a sudden, you had large writing staffs. And the streamers, it's my understanding, picked this up, and what they did was they said, let's have a writer's room. Let's hire, we have a show that we're interested. Maybe we'll give you development money. Maybe we'll pick it up. But we'll give you, did they say to the showrunner creator, we'll give you six writers, eight writers. You lay out the whole season, which may only be eight or 10 shows. You lay out the whole season, the characters, the arc of the show, uh, what the, uh, the plot of every episode, maybe it's an outline form, maybe whatever it is. And then if the show gets picked up, the next thing that happens is they fire six of those eight writers. And there are two guys, when I say guys, I mean, it could be women, two women left, who can then easily write the whole season by themselves. And you save a lot of money. And those writers that you have fired, they don't get anything. They got their salary for the four to six weeks that they were working to develop the season of the show. So I think one of the issues now is the writers are saying, in this strike, you can't do that. You hire people to develop a show and, and lay out the show. They have to stick with the show for the whole eight episodes, 10 episodes, and get credit and get residuals for the shows that they have created. That's a big issue. So the various WGA strikes reflect a constant struggle to defend the creative rights and compensation of writers in an ever-changing industry and especially in response to technological changes, what I've noticed. So the current strike, in addition to what you shared, I think mainly concerns residuals and agreements concerning streaming media. There was a 1953 strike that dealt with residuals for reruns on TV. The 1973 strike concerned residuals on video cassette sales and pay TV. There was a 1985 strike that included negotiations around made-for-basic cable projects. The 2000 strike involved made-for-internet, audiovisual programming, and on and on. So beyond kind of the, the solidarity among screenwriters and, as you mentioned, sort of the, the nice camaraderie you have with uh, standing around with your friends and getting nice uh, food trucks and that sort of thing, were any of these issues, uh, specifically technological changes or anything like that over the years, impact you particularly, any of these innovations in the industry? There were two big divisions and in the guild when I, about the time I got around. It was still screenwriters versus television writers. There was no affection between them. Uh, in fact, uh, I mean, television writers were looked down upon by screenwriters. The other issue, again, was as I, I mentioned earlier, is the uh, the uh, conflict, the writers becoming producers. You were either a writer or you were a producer. But if you were a writer producer, you were considered management, and uh, that didn't that wasn't successful. There was another issue which was, I don't know if you read about the Lionel Chetwin uh, issue, where Lionel Chetwin was a very successful screenwriter and television writer, television movie writer. He had a big career. He was a big guy in the 80s. He was in the Guild and said, I don't want to be 
bound by guild rules that affect my creativity or my ability to work. He was a staunch conservative. He was he he was an, an advisor to Reagan. He was an, I mean, but he was very much part of the conservative uh, group in, in, in the Writers Guild, and he refused to sign a Writers Guild contract on a movie that he was assigned to write and direct, and the Guild expelled him, and he sued the Guild, and he won. And they appealed, and he won again on the basis of his First Amendment right that they couldn't tell him where or how or for whom he could write. Uh, and strangely, it kind of, I mean, it, even though the Guild lost, it somehow it strengthened the ability of the writer to negotiate with uh, companies. I don't quite understand that. But that was, that was the tone, as I said, of the, it wasn't all, it wasn't friendly. Uh, there were real divisions, and the, the Mel Brooks story goes to that because it was, I don't know, it, was, it must have been the 80s or 70s. There was a big meeting, in, in a Writers Guild meeting, and uh, Mel Brooks and others uh, were talking about why should the high paid, highly paid writers such as himself uh, be bound uh, or uh, constricted by a strike that was really about issues that didn't affect them. They didn't care about minimums, weekly minimums. They didn't care about, they probably didn't care about residuals because they made so much money for what they were doing. And uh, yet at this, and, and, and this meeting, there were these two guys from uh, Schiller and Weisskopf, Bob, they were both Bobs, Bob Schiller and Bob Weisskopf. And they were, uh, Mel was going on about uh, the big writers and so forth and, and uh, and, and he caught the eye of uh, Weisskopf, who was looking at him really sternly. And, and Mel said, uh, stop. he says, listen, I just want to say one thing. He says, I didn't cross that picket line uh, to write. I crossed it to direct. And Weisskopf said, you call that directing? <laughs> and everybody just went back to laugh. And, and, and I have to say, Mel came down from the stage, and he gave him a big hug and kiss. But that was, you call that directing? I don't know what it was. The other thing is, uh, my I remember my first day picketing at Fox, and a Rolls Royce pulled up to the picket line on the curb. My guy got out, opened up his trunk, took out his picket sign, and joined the line. <laughs> and it was it was Danny Arnold who was the uh, uh, producer of uh, I think uh, Barney Miller. Yeah, he was he was great. But there it was, and I think his chauffeur. <laughs> drove his uh, Rolls Royce around the back. Uh, today, I find, I, as I pick it, I find much more unanimity among the writers. There isn't that division between screen and television or certainly streaming or whatever. Everybody, we're all, we're all in this, but there wasn't. The writer's Guild, uh, as I said, was went through a lot of, was stopped a lot of fights. And actually, that's been what I've seen of the strike as well. You know, I've actually held up strike signs in sports stadiums and had a lot of people around me, you know, from various other unions say that they support the writer's strike. Um, I know also a lot of actors are showing, showing up at the picket lines. And I think some of them are probably Writers Guild members. And I, I don't imagine that all of them are. Do you want to speak more broadly to your thoughts on uh, the importance of labor, labor unions in general? Look at me. I'm. Uh, I have a. I have a health plan, and I have a pension. You imagine a writer with a pension. I mean, and it's 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 one uh, I can live on. Uh, not here. I'd have to go to uh, Costa Rica, but I I can you know add Social Security and you know my residual whatever. But it is, it's it's damn good, and uh, it wouldn't I wouldn't have it if it weren't for the guild. I've been in a lot of unions in my life. I've been. In, I was a member of the teachers' union. I was equity. I was SAG after, uh, and briefly uh, in the directors' guild, which I, I, I found out I had because uh, I directed two. Uh, I directed a TV movie in a couple of episodes, and I had I had a nice chunk of money in my retirement uh, account, and I said, "Okay, can I have it?" <laughs> and they said. They looked me up. They said, "No, you have to direct one more movie." 
had to become vested. I said, I'll get on that right away. Uh, so they that that went away. But the the, the ser- seriously, I think the career now. I mean, I had a I had a 30, 40 year career of working. And today, I think the average career of a writer is four years. It's like about like an NFL player, and they, it's very hard to get vested in the uh, pension plan. Uh, that has to be adjusted. I mean, unions are really important, and I'm really happy that uh, we have a pro-union president. Uh, I think the history of America is made can be uh, seen through the prism of unions, uh, their ascendancy, and and their decline, which is really sad. The writer's skill, by the way, is not, I think it's technically in a union. It's a guild. And there's some arcane uh, difference between them, and it may have to do with who owns the material. You know, the studio owns the copyright of everything you do. Uh, and I don't know, that, that there was even some talk, I remember, uh, during one strike about we should dissolve the uh, Writers Guild and we should all join the Teamsters. I thought that was a good idea. <laughs> I, I just came back from London. Or I went to a really nice uh, solidarity demonstration in Leicester Square, uh, where the English writers and a lot of the below the line people, I asked the uh, kind of union supporting the American Writers Guild, which was really great, except they're still writing. <laughs> they're, we're, I, we appreciate their support. I think the, the writing these days is better than ever. There's no question about it. And I'm sorry that there are so many people having to sacrifice and, and be out of work for sports really important. And the studios are pigs, you know, and they just it's grotesque when you think about the salaries and the money they make. It's it's obscene. If you add they said if you add up all the salaries of the studio and and, and streaming executives, what the guild wants is a fractional, you know, a minor percentage of that, and they could do it in a minute, wouldn't notice it. But uh, I don't think it works that way. Uh, there's one other thing which uh, they used. To, Lou Wasserman, who was the chairman of Universal MCA, who was the Emin on Greece, or not even so Greece. He was just the he was the king of Hollywood. At a certain point, everybody would say during a strike, Lou's going to step in and he's going to settle this. Uh, I don't know if there's a Lou anymore, you know, if there's that godfather, that guy who could say, okay, this has gone on long enough. Now let's get real or whatever it is and and strike would be over. I also, in in terms of a difference, uh, you always used to hear rumors you know, when it's going to be over, what's going on. I don't hear any rumors anymore. People say, yeah, the, the fall. And I talked to, I have a couple of friends who are agents and took to some writers, but it's very tight. You don't hear any rumors. And then you only think of uh, William Goldwyn, Goldman's, uh, you know, nobody knows anything. So that's the way I feel it is now. I'm wondering if, you're, if you've put any thought into these, speaking of rumors, you know, the potential threat of AI kind of stepping in to write things, um, you know, in place of human writers or with, you know, a, a human overseer that sort of just tweaks what AI comes up with and that being a, a shortcut around these writers who are fighting for, you know, just employment and so forth. I guess it should be like cigarette packs. You know, this is not written by a human being. I mean, that's one of the things, a warning. But what would the difference be? Then there are a lot, I see a lot of stuff. I mean, I see movies uh, that I say, yeah, this could have been written by AI. I mean, Car Chase 9355, uh, you know, give me a, uh, a gun battle with, uh, you know, 16 uh, uh, Taliban's against uh, Jake Gyllenhaal and whatever. 
give me some words for them to say, move, move, go, go, down, down. Are you okay? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, AI in a minute, man. And, and uh, it's fine. And, and uh, so I don't know. And, he, and in a funny kind of way, that's what I didn't like about the room where I would say, how do you have eight people trying to write a nightmare or a fantasy or whatever it is? But forget about that for a minute. Let's, let's stick to AI. So I don't, th I, I think AI could easily write as badly as a lot of stuff is written today. There's so many uses for AI. Uh, I'm writing a novel and I've come to a part of the novel where I don't have, it's not a question of the information. And I thought, okay, I'm going to see if AI can write this scene for me in this novel. I said, this is what I, I need. I have these two characters and this is a little bit of the history and this is Google Bard. Send me, you know, whatever. And they, they sent me a nice essay kind of about the topic which if I handed it in high school, I would have gotten a B plus, but it was useless for my novel. But it may be because I'm not a good AI uh, writer yet or a question, questioner yet, but I, I may be. I asked AI to tell me about Google, to tell me about Michael Elias, the writer, and they wrote back. And they, again, it was a nice little essay about me, a biographical essay. At the end, it said, I'm married uh, to my sister. To my sister, Ruth Rogers. Michael Elias is married to Ruth Rogers, and they live in London. No. Or the other one, I tried again. It said, Michael Elias is married to Connie Stevens. I went, oh, does she know? So, <laughs> but that's, they'll, they'll figure that stuff out. Oh, then I wrote, I asked, I said, my uh, this novel I'm writing has, has, a, has a murder in it. It's uh, And it takes place during a scuba dive, a night scuba dive. So I said, I had already written the scene, so I know what I was, what I had. So I said to the AI, I said, uh, "How would you? How would somebody kill somebody underwater uh, during a scuba dive?" And they wrote back and say, "We're not allowed to give you this. We don't want to give you this. If you have done it, you should confess me. <laughs> you should confess, or whatever, or see us like uh, anyway." But they got it right. And then, though, then I asked it again. If I were writing a novel. And I was needed a scene in which a character did this. What would they do? And they gave me back almost exactly what I had already written. So they were pretty good. Or they caught wind of what you had already written. Well, except it wasn't published. Oh, maybe they did. That's right. How naive. Of course. They stole, <laughs> they stole me, my thing and gave it back to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so uh, kind of touching on some of what you mentioned about uh, who has the power in this industry and so forth. I happen to re be reading an Archie comic the other day, which I happen to do from time to time, and it included a story called Letter of Appreciation. And in it, Chuck, who's an aspiring comic book artist, convinces his friend Betty to write a letter to her favorite author. And she assumes that the author gets a lot of fan mail, so why bother? But Chuck tells her, it might be like comic book writers. Fans of comics often remember to tell the artists how much they like their work, but they usually forget the writers. And, you know, of course, there are famous comic book writers. There are a lot of famous screenwriters. But in general, and you've mentioned this before in our previous interview, um, you know, if you're not the director, you really don't have a lot of attention. You don't have a lot of clout. Maybe if you're not the lead actor in certain situations, you don't have that force. And then uh, I looked up the Directors Guild of America, which apparently only went on strike once before for about three hours in the morning of July 13th, 1987. So I'm wondering if, if you think, and you probably do, uh, if this kind of underappreciation of the writer is a factor in terms of the kind of periodic strikes that happen. I think the history in Hollywood of the relationship between the studios and the writers is, and the critics and the film writers is all about the director. The directors, as I said, the directors have the power. The first thing a director says when you give a director a script, unless you know them and you're, unless you're a collaborator, they say, thank you very much, you're fired. And they bring in another writer. Sometimes, with the sometimes it's from the studio, but a lot of times the director says, 
that's pretty close. Let's bring in another writer. Get me, uh, get me, uh, she was famous for it, Carrie Fisher, to punch up the women's parts. Uh, get me somebody else to punch up the actor, the, the, the action series sequence. The other thing is when a director agrees to direct a movie, oftentimes it's not exactly the movie he wants to direct. It's a, he has a vision. Watch out for directors with a vision. He has a vision of what this movie should be. And the screenplay kind of approximates it, but it's not it. Anyway, this is all to say that the director has the power in film, where the director doesn't have the power anymore, and that's how the whole paradigm has changed, is in streaming television. because, And that was always in television, where the writer had the power. The writer, producer, creator, showrunner had the power, because the director only wanted to come back next week and shoot another episode. And the writer, you could not have a television series without writers who could write that first chapter of the novel, which was the pilot, and make sure it's consistent for the next 26 episodes or five years. You can't have a new writing team come in and all of a sudden uh, Archie Bunker, you know, Carol O'Connor saying, what happened? You changed my character, which is the nature of a writer. You come in and say, I can fix this. So you needed guys and women to keep that consistency uh, and they were writers. You didn't need it. And then when a director came on the set on a television show, I, as the writer producer, could say, I don't like that. Shoot it again. If I ever said that to a film director, his next words would be security out, you know, and, and that's the reality. So when the studios are settling with the directors, it's a much more, in, in, for films, it's much more, we really, We'll give them what they want. And uh, and there's one other thing about the Director's Guild. The majority of people in the Director's Guild are not directors. They're uh, assistant directors. They're uh, DPs. They're all these other below-the-line people who are not directors, uh, who don't get, get residual, who don't get the same benefits that directors, their, their directors get, but they'll vote along with them because they'll get increase in, in, in salaries. So when the studios are settling with the directors and giving them whatever they want, it's it's a fraction of how, what they have would have to give the writers or the actors. The other thing is that happens in Hollywood is you have three major unions. You have the directors, you have the writers, and you have SAG to get after. Okay. We all, our contracts all expire at different times. So you can play them off against each other. So you can have directors settle and, or negotiate, or writers, writers usually go first. And we do the heavy lifting. Then the directors, they settle with the directors and the actors, they get what's left in a way. And, uh, and actually the truth of the matter is they're the most important because you if the actors go on strike, everything shuts down. That's it. If writers go on strike, you have, uh, you know, the studios and they 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 bank material. They have Netflix has more material than it knows what to do with. And that's the other thing about AI. When if you buy a Bulgarian television series about a, about cops, you can dub it with George Clooney's voice in the lead, right? You could whatever you want to do. So uh, that's the only thing. It's, uh, and, uh, so it's a tough time. But again, I think really our demands are, are not, they're not that big. I don't know what the thinking is. There's another theory out there. I'm not sure that the people who, uh, the old, in the old days, I hate that expression, but in the old days, people who ran studios loved movies. They were interested in movies. Uh, and now it's it's all corporate. But I've been hearing it's all corporate all my life. Well, maybe it's more corporate now than it was corporate back then, you know? I talked to a few of my friends who are involved in unscripted, quote-unquote, TV, reality television, etc. And they say that they're actually benefiting from the writer's strike, that their productions continue, that in fact there's more investment in that side of the industry. And that seems like something of a competition and something a little nefarious perhaps that that occurs uh periodically as well i don't know if you heard anything about how that well, lifts. 
Yeah, I can say that at Fox, every billboard looking down on the Writers Guild strike is for a reality show. Also, the the soap opera writers, um, which used to account for all of the money in daytime television, they weren't represented by the Writers Guild. And then there would uh, animation, and part of it was the Writers Guild fault. Ah, we don't want those soap opera writers. Ah, we don't want those, uh, you know, cartoon writers and stuff like that. Now I think we want them all. But uh, there was a lot of snobbishness and snobbery on the uh, part of the Writers Guild. I remember even going to a meeting once where the somebody said, got up and said something about late night writers, you know, and he said, well, what do they write? And he said, somebody said, well, they write the monologue. They write all the jokes. Really? I thought Johnny Carson made that stuff up by himself. So that was, you know, the same. And, and he didn't think those people should be in the Writers Guild or originally what it was, the Screenwriters Guild. I think that's kind of the main rub here is that you have these writers who you rely on to make your product. And, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, there's a lot of greed and all of that stuff that we've talked about. But ultimately, to expect these low-paid workers to live in a place like L.A., where all the studios are, that's kind of, well, it's not just impractical, it's cruel, right? I imagine some of these writers who are working on our favorite shows have five roommates because they just can't make a, a real living doing their good work of making our lives better. It's really uh, quite a travesty. Well, the thing is also, what if you get successful and you're in your 30s and you have kids? And it turns out that your success, yeah, hey, I'm writing this series or I'm on this Apple show or whatever. But it's it's transit. It doesn't last long. If it's, you know, hey, I got to show eight episodes, 10 episodes. That's it. So maybe you make $4,000 a week on those or per episode. I don't know. So it's 40 grand. You can live on that in LA. And if you got two kids, I mean, what I'm saying is that writing, you don't, usually you don't get paid starting. You may not be starting until you're 30 or 32. I think I didn't get started till I was 31. That's why I came to LA. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. It's always great to talk to you and to our audience. Now back to your regularly scheduled lives. Amusing Jews is here to amuse you. If you like being amused, go ahead and click like and subscribe.